I'm Ben Johnson. I'm the director of Northrop Concerts and Lectures at the University of Minnesota. And we are in this process, this process of some pretty radical change on our campus right now. And um, I wanted to show, with you, show you what we're planning to do with our existing 80-year-old building that's never been touched, some of the best thinking that's going into that, and then share with you just some things that I'm observing in the world of teaching and learning um, in institutions of higher learning, because I think there's a lot of pollination that can happen between what happens in arts institutions and what's happening in um, educational institutions. And I also firmly believe that how students are taught and how teachers teach tell people how to appreciate the performances that they are about to attend. And so I think that I've spent a lot of time the last 20 years doing things across the board, K-12 and through university systems, and I'm trying to take all of that learning into how we are transforming what we do in the arts. But first, Northrop Auditorium um, <laughs> has been around for 80 years. It's never been renovated. It seats 4,800 4, people. and. It's currently viewed as a rock in the stream, that nobody goes to this facility, that it has a pretty high profile performing arts series, but it has no relevance with the university. And when Dale Schatzlein died about four years ago, they thought that they were going to just tear down the building because they didn't know what to do with it. Then they stopped that thought, and they had a reimagining that this facility could actually be renovated and turned into the epicenter of campus where it could be a place to realize and solve world problems like they're doing um, in Mike Ross's camp and also be a place to deliver creative research, a place to animate curriculum, and a place to transform campus and community through culture. So you can see the historic building is right there. This is the Gilbert Cass original drawings. This is the Mississippi River. These are some things that no longer exist. But here it is at the end of the mall. And it was originally designed as a lecture hall uh, and not a performing arts facility to house the entire student body of the entire campus. There it is, there it is today. Oops. And they've done like 14 assessments. And so they've realized that they know how to assess the hell out of this building but don't know how to fix it. And every single aspect of the building is challenged and ready to fail. And if anything fails, the building closes. And if they don't, the longer they wait, the more expensive it um, uh, will be. They have decided, though, that they have a couple of different options. One is to either just fix it how it is, which will cost $100 million, or renovate it completely, which will only cost 80 So then they, they've come up with a vision, like Susie has suggested, some talking points. And they brought in some of the best leadership in the field. Um, to help think through and redesign it, one of them being one of the people being David Taylor from Arup, who has been speaking here. I don't know where where he is right now. If he wants to raise his hand, great. So this is how they have attempted to think about transforming Northrop from modest contributions to academic life to a vital center of distinction that advances key academic priorities. Rock in the stream to a destination. It's literally right in the middle of campus, but literally nobody goes in there. But what's fascinating is if you work in that building, you see all of these students in there who want peace and quiet so they can focus on their technology. <laughs> Transform to be from irrelevant to students to a bustling dynamic place for collaboration, study, conversation, central to everyday life on campus, from rarely used to teeming with activity all the time from outdated dreadful acoustics and distant sight lines to preeminent cultural centers of leading edge technologies. The last thing the Twin Cities needs is another, is a poorly designed theater. They have amazing theaters, and you, there's always room for one more good one, but there's not room for one more bad one. From unconnected with the, with the people from Minnesota to a global platform that connects the university with global audiences. And what's key to this whole thing, and I think this is a really interesting way that they're positioning this building, is they're actually moving four different departments into the same building. One is a, a department called uh, Institute for Advanced Study, which is basically the humanities program on campus. The other one is the honors program, which has, what does it say? Has, we have 500 honors students. And then another program called um, Innovation by Design, which is um, out of our business um, school, which is about you know, solving the world's problem through new innovation. So here you have the Performing Arts Center, which is now being positioned as an academic center purposefully, which is bringing together all the best intellectuals and leadership from the community, the best thinking, through the Institute for Advanced Study, all the smartest students from campus, all the business leaders who are innovating, plus the concerts and lectures program to sort of animate it all. I'm not going to read through these, but these have all been mentioned over the course of today. 
So you can see that this is how what the hall looks like now. And the, um, this is what it will look like. And so the public spaces are in the yellow. 4,800 people can fit in this hall, but only about 1,000 people can fit in the lobby in the wintertime. There's one elevator for 4,800 people. And this is what the new redesign will look like with a lot more um, space, as well as they've kicked out the back um, theater, so it's a much larger stage. These are some existing photos of the hall. And it's just really going to transform and have a kind of lobby, a full-scale lobby that you can do all sorts of things. And the keys to some of these, um, what they're thinking about is that not only will it pro programmatically be open 24-7, I don't know what that means in reality, but they're thinking to be used a lot more than it is now. But that every space is multi-purpose, like uh, Michael has wanted. Every space can be used both for creation space for artists and for students um, and for faculty to be used. Everything is tricked out with technology or not. And everything is um, transparent or not, even the, the, the main hall itself. Just more, more photos, more maps. Um, there, has been cr there have been cries of bloody murder because of the preservationists who have not want this touched, but they are preserving all the architectural details for the most part in this building, which are actually quite stunning. And this is what the new space will look like. It'll go from 4,800 seats to 2,800 seats, plus there will be a 200 seat, um, oops, multi-use uh, recital hall here as well as offices here, and then there'll be um, other kinds of rehearsal rooms, donors' rooms, and social spaces throughout, including a restaurant, which has never existed before. You know, the campus really needed another place for students to take their parents other than the new stadium. And so that's how they're really thinking of this as the new center for the campus to really bring the entire community together. And these are sort of like the big mantras that um, we are using for talking about the new Northrop. So what does that all mean, though, in terms of how we're programming for this kind of space, as well as what are some big ideas that we're seeing happen on campus? So I called, like Susie, the, the head of curriculum, who is responsible for teaching 50,000 people, well, what are your spaces that you're looking for the delivery of teaching and learning? And she said primarily that the spaces aren't changing that much. Class sizes are getting a little bit bigger because of budget cuts, but that, and there are some of those smart rooms being delivered, um, which are tricked out spaces that are primarily being um, uh, led by the science buildings that are, that, that are investing in all of the smart spaces with the whiteboards and the smart boards. But she said what they're noticing primarily is that this world of technology has just completely is overwhelming the entire university. And students do ha know how to tweet and they do know how to Facebook, but they lack a severe um, lack of sophistication about how to use that technology. So they're designing a whole slew of new courses that really embrace the technology, but to teach them to be more sophisticated about it. For instance, so this idea, as Michael said, about iPods is they have a whole bunch of new courses that are about students just bringing their iPods to class, and they're going to examine the musical choices for a whole semester for each person, tells them about what, who they are as a person, about what they're choosing on their iPod and how they're arranging it. So they're looking at things like that. Um, they're also starting this whole program called Course Transformation, which is they're going school by school, course by course, with a team of technology experts to say, what is your pedagogy, what are you teaching, and how can we incorporate technology into that to actually enhance and enliven the teaching, not destroy it? And they have found that that works, and that sometimes doesn't. It has worked with, um, so for example, if they're videotaping um, speech classes, and the faculty member can actually type out responses that can stream below the person's speech. They can go back and revisit that speech over and over and over again. It's really helpful. But when they recently did a course transformation on um, a course that was about culture, race, and the community, they found that being able to be anonymous without ramifications about what you're posting when you're talking about issues of race is really problematic. So they've eliminated technology from courses. So sometimes it doesn't work, but they've, they've gone through this process of really looking with a team of people how to actually incorporate technology into the teaching and learning. So I'm always thinking, well, how can I have this team of people to really incorporate into my performances to actually enhance all the teaching and learning? Um, and I'll stop there. <laughs>